I hope you uh, will come away from this talk uh, just understanding one, one main thing. The scientists who study human evolution study it from a bazillion different ways of knowing, a bazillion different lines of evidence. I think that a lot of people who are skeptical of, of the idea that humans evolved, um, they, they think it comes down to a few fossils. You know, they, we found some fossils, some skulls that look funny, and we built this whole big story of evolution out of that. Um, but the reality is that we study evolution um, from a whole variety of different ways and looking at different aspects of our bodies and, of course, fossils. And the stunning convergence of evidence all sort of tells the same story. And that's what's so surprising about the, ev uh, the evidence that we have. But the evidence for evolution comes from a whole, whole variety of mechanisms. And I want to talk a little bit about what that is. But I also want to say one thing quickly. I mean, I have the... the task of talking about all the evidence for human evolution in 15 minutes. I don't think anybody's ever accomplished that or even come close. Um, so uh, until my slides are up, don't start my time, please. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, uh, one thing I want to talk about uh, when it comes to this is that there are a lot of debates about um, how evolution works, about the various mechanisms of selection, for example. And these are very scientific debates, very technical debates. And then there are also debates of people you'll see fighting on YouTube videos about things like intelligent design, old earth creationism, young earth creationism, and trying to parse out various um, stances on how evolution works. You have theistic evolution, or sometimes called evolutionary creationists. I'm not going to talk about any of that. The reason why is that those various mechanisms, I consider that a fairly technical debate. What I want to talk about is the evidence that evolution happened. Because that's the idea that there is almost a near-perfect consensus about. Very few scientists, almost zero scientists, quarrel with the idea that we evolved. That we evolved from ancestors that don't look like us, but that were other ape species, and that we have common ancestry. And common ancestry is going to come up a lot tonight. Common ancestry just means that if you go far enough back in time, we share ancestors with other living things with chimpanzees, for example. And so, for example, chimpanzees, the most recent common ancestor, and they are our closest relative, is about seven million years ago. A species lived that, uh, whose descendants diverged into two camps, diverged into many camps, but at least two camps that we know of uh, that have descendants now, two species of chimpanzees and modern humans. So that's what I want to talk to you about, is the, the idea that humans basically played by all the same rules as every other living thing on this planet, lived, died, thrived, failed in various ways, and gave rise to the next generation. That was a little bit different than the generation that came before it, and so goes the process of evolution. All right, so let me talk about the converging lines of evidence. First of all, we can talk about anatomy. And this is what most people think of when they think about evolution, because they're thinking about fossils and fossil anatomy. And certainly, we have a lot of evidence for human evolution that comes from our anatomy. Talk about that. That's the one I'm going to talk about tonight. We also have evidence for human evolution in our biochemistry, in the way that our molecules are built, their shape, their function, who they interact with. These also tell the story of evolution. And there are people who study protein functions, who study them from the evolutionary point of view. Our DNA, which is the genetic material, the material of inheritance that gets transmitted from generation to generation, that's the richest source of information about our past. Even as we are right now, we don't need a single fossil to be able to learn a lot about our past simply by looking uh, at our genetics, looking at our DNA. We also have evidence from archaeology. Archaeology is the study of man-made things, uh, the study of artifacts. However, that doesn't begin just a few thousand years ago. Archaeology considers evidence that goes back three million years uh, from the, fir the first uh, forging of stone tools in Central Africa. And those stone tools have a rich history as well that shows evolution through the process of our cognitive ability as well as our dexterity of our ancestors. We can also look at our behavior and the behavior of other animals and what we presume to be the behavior of extinct hominins. Hominins are human relatives. And uh, that tells a fascinating story of evolution. And then, of course, we have something called the principle of parsimony. Um, any philosophers in here will be very familiar with this work. The word parsimony basically means the simplest explanation that is consistent with the facts. Okay, Einstein once summarized it this way. 
Your explanation be, should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Uh, and so when you look at all of the lines of evidence that we have, from anatomy to genes to, to protein function, when you consider behavior and fossils, stone tools, and when they're all pointing in the same direction, it seems like the simplest explanation is that we evolved, and that we evolved and we arrived to this form through an evolutionary mechanism. If you quarrel with that and you believe that we didn't evolve, you have a ton of work to do arguing with every single line of evidence that we use. And so that's why I consider myself an evangelist, um, to get you excited about these many lines of evidence. And, and this is why I go out of my way to travel the country with Josh and to, to meet with Bill Craig and other uh, Christians who are doing the work of um, evolution, uh, talking about evolution, because I'm trying to share my enthusiasm for this. And it's been always frustrating for me that when people don't believe in evolution, because it's such a wonderful process, it's such an exciting science uh, to talk about evolution. So let me show you a little bit of the evidence and why it gets me so excited. So let's talk about anatomy. Um, the, the fancy word for anatomy is morphology. That's what we would say uh, in, in the study of anthropology. We would say morphology. We always, in science, you guys have probably learned this now, we like to take a regular word and then make it fancy and hard to pronounce because that way we sound smart, right? But the word morphology just means anatomy. When you're talking about anatomy, you need to consider modern anatomy and fossil anatomy. And what's great is, again, they tell the same story. So we can look at our bodies as they are now, and we can see the signs of evolution. For example, we are built, our body, with a whole bunch of what we call historical contingencies. If you look at the skeleton of all terrestrial vertebrates, so these are tetrapods, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, their chassis that forms their skeleton is remarkably homologous, right? It's very, very similar. We have one bone in the upper arm, two bones in the lower arm. One bone in the upper leg, two bones in the upper leg. Seven wrist bones. All of this, the feet, the ankles, all of these things are incredibly similar among all these animals that use their bodies in totally different ways. They have almost nothing in common with how they use their limbs, but yet they have the same structural chassis. What is the simpler explanation for that? A design perspective gives you, gets you nowhere in trying to explain that anatomy. But if you consider common ancestry as the reason for our commonalities in our skeleton, it explains it. And there's extreme versions of these historical contingencies. These are called vestigial structures. So they are structures that you have in your body that, don't do, that doesn't do anything. It's not helpful for you, it has no function, but it's left over from evolution because it was important for our ancestors. One example. Many of you, if you pinch your uh, pinky and your thumb together, I don't have it. <laughs> so I, I hate this example because I don't have it. Uh, about 20% of the population doesn't have it. But many of you will have a tendon right here that connects to your palmaris longus muscle. Right? This muscle does absolutely nothing for you, but your ancestors use it to grasp trees. Our, all right? Many human ancestors were arboreal. They lived in the trees. And so that muscle was very important to them. It is not important for you, proof is, uh, I don't have it, and I do just fine. And actually, if you need a tendon for somewhere else in your body, the first place the surgeons look is right there because they can take it from your body with no loss of function. It is vestigial. The same thing with your tailbone. The last three vertebrae are fused together to form a structure called the coccyx, the tailbone. It does nothing for you. You don't sit on it. You use it for nothing, and it can be removed. And in fact, it can sometimes get cancer. It's very rare, but you can get cancer of the tailbone. The surgeons will remove it, and you will be no worse off because it doesn't do anything for you. Speaking of the tailbone, there's also a muscle that most of us have, but not everybody, in the groin uh, called the pyramidus muscle. This muscle attaches to those fixed bone, bones. So you don't have a tail, but if you did, you could flex it. <laughs> you have the muscle to move your tail around even though you don't have one. What's the simpler explanation of that? Um, what's interesting about these vestigial structures is it also opens up the possibility of what we call spontaneous revertance. So this, these are examples of mutations that emerge that are called reverse mutations. They undo an earlier mutation that happened in our past. And I'll give you a, a pretty striking example of this. This is a dolphin that was found in the South Pacific that has small, whoops, small but otherwise perfectly formed hind fins. Dolphins are not supposed to have hind fins. Most dolphins do not have hind fins. But through a spontaneous mutation, which has been published and studied, um, it, it undid a developmental program that was shut off earlier in its evolution that was turned back on through the spontaneous mutation. 
Obviously, other mutations would be required to get it fully functional, but there you have those two perfectly formed miniature hind limbs on that dolphin. And guess what? There have been humans who have been born with spontaneous revertent mutations. Um, many of you probably know that when you were an embryo, you had a tail. Well, occasionally humans are born with a mutation that fails to turn off the program to regress that tail. So instead of regressing, the tail gets perfectly formed. And um, this individual, they can remove the tail, obviously, with no problem. But why would we have all of the genetic and developmental programs necessary to form a tail in the first place that, that could be then reactivated? We also, we also have many examples in our body of what I call suboptimal design. And I wrote a whole book about these examples. Um, I, there's other words for this. You don't have to call it suboptimal design if you don't want to. I choose to call it suboptimal design to annoy Josh because I know he doesn't like it. But the point is, is we have many examples of poor design through our body, including right in, your, right in your face. Right behind your cheekbones are two large sinus cavities that first of all are pointless also. You don't need them. But they drain at the top. The, the drainage pipe, the ostium to drain the mucus from this is at the top. What plumber puts the drain at the top, right? But, but if you understand the evolution of the human face, uh, we can understand how that drainage pipe got so poorly designed. So that's just some examples from modern anatomy. Let's look at fossil anatomy for a second. For one thing, what we found is in the fossil record, you have gaps, right? You have this species, and then we hypothesize that it evolved into this one. Well, over the course of the last 100 years, as fossils found, we keep filling in the gaps. We don't even use the language missing link anymore because it's kind of ridiculous that everything we find is a missing link. But in a sense, it is because we have a, a, an unbroken ancestry with our ape-like ancestors, and we keep finding the transitions. So for example, um, this was a, a, a very famous example of a missing link. We have modern whales here have their blowhole right in the top of their head, right? Well, we believe that their ancestors, the Pachycetus, uh, was this species from 50 million years ago. Well, their nostrils are in the front of their snout like any other mammal. So the hypothesis, whoops, I pushed the answer too fast there. The hypothesis would be that a creature somewhere along the line would be somewhere halfway between or something because nostrils wouldn't just jump from the front to the top in one generation. There must have been something in between. Well, sure enough, not too long ago, uh, another an whale ancestor was found and the nostrils were at a midpoint in their skull. So we call that a missing link or filling a gap. But the same thing has been found in human evolution as well. Lots of fossils that are found fill in the relationships that we only hypothesized before. And so when new species are found, they're plugged into a tree. And this tree has a remarkable amount of convergence and consilience in the story that it tells. When I gave you the, the number seven million years from our last um, common ancestor with chimpanzees, I, I, I couldn't even name all the lines of evidence that all point to that number. All right? It isn't just one place, and we didn't just average a bunch of things. All of the lines of evidence all point uh, to a common ancestry within between six and a half and seven million years. Um, we also know that, that humans have played by the same rules, ancestral humans, meaning they live, they die, they thrive, they fail, they explore new environments, and they undergo what's called mosaicism, which is um, a exploration of different traits and features in different environments, winners and losers, and that's how things go. And what we found in the human fossil record is it's not just one unbroken line from an ancestor to an ancestor to an ancestor to us, but rather it's a bushy tree of evolutionary species, of all these transitions, of experimentation, almost exclusively in Africa, but lots of experimentation with different climates, different ways of living. The Ardipithecus group at the very root um, of our ancestry, um, all of these species went extinct. We have two big branches of Australopithecines, the, the gracile and the robust, all of them went extinct. But at some point, a branch gave rise to our genus, the Homo genus, in the last two million years. Most of those species have all gone extinct and they've experimented all different ways and only our lineage survives. And this is, this is what we would predict if we were undergoing an evolutionary process. Evolution doesn't work from this thing getting perfected to this thing getting perfected to this thing. That's not how evolution works. It's bushy and messy and lots of extinction. Our family tree is filled with extinct relatives. We're the only ones left. 
Also, I, I think a curious one, you, you won't find this on a lot of blogs about human evolution, but I think it really proves the point, is we have what's called, um, uh, well, oh, sorry, the, my penultimate point here, is you also find an incredible amount of what I call chronological coherence. So when you find these missing links, they don't just look halfway between the two species that we think they're related from, they're also the right age. And that happens again and again. The age matches up with what we expect the transitional form to be. So if you look at, for example, this is just one feature, the expansion of the human cranium over the last seven million years. Well, once you figure out the ancestors, and you do this by looking at the entire skeleton, right? We not, don't just use the cranium. We look at the entire what's called postcranial skeleton, and we, we uh, put these things into a family tree. But if you date these, these um, skulls, they show this convergence and coherence in their chronology. Every, it's not random, right? It all follows a distinct path. And again, principle of parsimony, how do you explain that other than the fact that these really are evolutionary transitions? The same thing can be done with the hips. And of course, the skull size and the hips were changing at the same time as evolution pulled on both ends of that rope. I make a big deal about that in one of the chapters of my book. And then we have this thing called peculiar ecological adaptation. So humans would find themselves, uh, human ancestors, would find themselves in peculiar environments, and then they would evolve according to the rules of that environment. My, the, the best example of this I can think of is, so there's a phenomenon uh, when mammals find themselves on an island and can't get off. So you, they colonize an island, a species of mammal. One thing happens again and again when this happens. The mammals evolve to be smaller. The reason why is an island is a finite resource and it has finite resources. So if you're a species of, I don't know, let's say elephant, and you find yourself on an island stuck there, if you stay the same size that you are, you could only support a population of a handful of elephants. And very low population numbers equals very low genetic diversity, and, diver and low diversity is very bad for a species. So what does the elephant do over time is they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. There have been fossil elephants found on islands in the Pacific this big. I'm not kidding you. There are tiny miniature elephants that have evolved on these islands because mammals evolved to be smaller. Well, a, a population of what we now know is Homo erectus found itself on the island of Flores in Indonesia. And they evolved into what we now call Homo floresiensis. These were miniature humans. You may have found, you may have heard the term the hobbits, these are the hobbits, Homo floresiensis. And the reason why they evolved this small body, about half the size of a modern human, is because they were on a limited resource island, Flores. Um, and so this is why I think it's, it's, in, it's parsimonious to think that humans evolved the way everything else did, is we follow the same rules. We find ourselves in environments that we explore uh, with innovation, and every single extinct hominin was the smartest thing that ever lived on the planet up to that point, and it still went extinct. That's what I think is most amazing. We think our, our big brains and our intelligence were the secret to everything. We almost went extinct. All of our relatives who were super duper smart compared to chimpanzees and gorillas, they all went extinct. We almost didn't make it, um, and that's, that's kind of the rule of evolution. So I was gonna talk about anatomy, and then I was gonna talk about genetics, but I'm now out of time. <laughs> so I have to stop here. But uh, the genetic evidence is even more convincing, and I think that uh, actually Josh can talk a little bit about it, and that's actually what I do is, is genetic evolution. Hi, my name's Josh Swamidas. I'm a scientist at Washington University in St. Louis. That's what I do in my day job. I'm also a Christian. What you've seen here is that one of the, the hardest things to ask a biologist to do is to summarize the evidence for human evolution in 15 minutes. <laughs> it's very, very hard to do that. Um, I've heard a lot of talks like that before, and I, um, you know, I was, I was born and raised in a, in a young earth creationist house. We really believe the earth was just 6,000 years old, and the guy kind of created everything out of scratch, and this evolution thing wasn't true. And in fact, I mean, I would hear talks like this, and I would easily be able to pick holes in it, and I don't know what your background is. Maybe you, you, um, you were able to do that too. I certainly was growing up. And a lot of things about human evolution in particular just seem to be pretty ridiculous. But I'll tell you what, I did change my mind. And what I thought I really wanted to focus on today is just how I changed my mind. It's going to touch on some stuff from my book, 
probably going to talk about that a great deal. But there was really three things that I had to see for myself. They were roughly chronological order, but it wasn't like single moments. It was stuff that happened over an extended period. And I want to tell you these three things that I saw. Uh, the first thing I could see is that human evolution could fit with scripture. Uh, that, that was probably and has always been the fundamentally most important thing for me. And I'll, I'll even tell you this, until I could see how if evolution was true, it wouldn't conflict with scripture, until I could see that, I had a hard time even approaching the scientific evidence. So the reason why, I mean, I was a science student. I really loved the science. As I would get into it, I'd start to understand things. And it was difficult because I would really feel threat to some other things that I knew. I didn't know how these things fit together. And it wasn't really until I could see how they could fit together if it was true. I mean, I still thought evolution was false, to be clear. <laughs> but until I could see how, if evolution is true, there wasn't necessarily a conflict, that's when I was able to kind of sit down, relax a little bit, not quite have so much the fear, and really try to seek understanding. And um, when I started to look at the scientific evidence for human evolution, that's the other thing where I've had a real privilege just by becoming a scientist and a computational biologist. And it was probably uh, fairly late, I would say, even in my scientific education, because there isn't really any inquisitions in the scientific education about what you personally believe, right? It was fairly late when I was really fully convinced. And I'll tell you about that. I, I, just this key piece of it was seeing that evidence for myself and seeing how it made sense. So, you know, Nathan went through a ton of different things. Frankly, any individual one of the things he talked about, he could have probably given a one or two hour talk on. Is that fair? <laughs> um, and what I found out actually is that there was all these arguments against evolution that I'd learned. Um, when I scratched deeper, I learned into it, I found out that, 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 that it was actually fairly skin deep or very surface level what was being said. When I start to see all of these um, evolutionary arguments and really study them and understand them, I found out that, that there was really just a lot more underneath the surface and there was a lot more coherence and it was surprising to me. But I would say the last part, um, that wasn't enough. It wasn't just scripture and science. I think the last part was really understanding where my foundation is and finding it in Jesus. So I'm talk briefly about scripture, which is really the focus of my book. And this is one place where actually I came to a very different um, position than a lot of people. I'd say most Christians that came to it from evolution um, really uh, took a position where they really changed a lot of their beliefs about Genesis because they thought evolution really forced them to. For me, um, I, I actually couldn't see the conflict in the same, room, the same way everyone could. I kind of talked to people about it. I didn't have it all figured out by any means, um, but I, I didn't know the scientific language to explain what was going on, but I had a sense of this fairly early on. There's something that people were missing in the conversation. That's what ending up, my book ends up being about. If you look historically to it, how Christians have really engaged with these questions of evolution, no one until very recently has had much of a problem with an old earth or with uh, evolution among animals or plants, the real challenge is human evolution. And the reason why is because what Genesis uh, 2, 3, and 4 say, and what Romans says, and what 1 Corinthians says, really has to do with human origins. Even if you go to the Scopes trial, uh, William Jennings Bryan was an old earth creationist, and he had no problem with evolution. The real key problem was human evolution. That's what the Scopes trial is. That's why it's called the monkey trial, right? And what I found out is that what people thought was in conflict really isn't. These two things can be true at the same time, both Adam and Eve and evolution. So what do I mean by Adam and Eve and evolution? By Adam and Eve, I, I mean uh, two people that were created without parents, so sometime less than 10,000 years ago, and they're ancestors of everyone. I think that's how most Christians have understood Adam and Eve over the last several thousand years. And then by evolution, I just mean that we have common ancestors with the great apes and that you know, our ancestral populations were large. It was never just a single couple. People just thought that, that those five things together can never be true at the same time. You have to pick and choose some of these. So you either have to kind of pick and choose from evolution or pick and choose from Adam and Eve. It turns out that all five of these things can be true at the same time. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and people didn't know that, I would say, until my book came out or in the lead up to my book, I would say. So how is that? Well, if you actually look at how Christians have really understood Genesis, you can see Adam and Eve here at, this, at the tip, and that's kind of humanity being formed as it kind of spreads out across the entire earth. And you can see Genesis there. 
And then in the New Testament, Paul talks about um, how, you know, we all descend from Adam and Eve. That's how it's been understood. But a key thing to keep in mind there is there's a question mark. One of the big questions as you read through Genesis, and the people have been wondering about long before evolution, is what about outside the garden? What's going on out there? And there's been a lot of people who have wondered about people outside the garden. Now, one way you could take it is to take that question mark and erase it and just say, well, there's no one outside. That's what some people do. That's not what scripture teaches or says, but you could do that. And then that's when you start to have a lot of conflict with science. But that's not actually what the Genesis tradition binds us to. It leaves that as an open mystery, an open question. So what I suggested is maybe there were people outside that God created a different way, that God created by a process of common descent that's providentially governed, Maybe he's miraculously intervening at different points. That's fine. But then at a certain point in history, God creates specially Adam and Eve. And they become ancestors of everyone fairly quickly. Now, the big objection that people are going to say, but I thought mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam were 100,000 years ago. And you're right. They were, they were a long time ago. This gets to the distinction between genetic and genealogical ancestry. If you look right here, you can see you right there. You see where that is? It's really big. And right, um, that shell right outside that right here is your mom and your dad, okay? And they're um, at 50% gray because you get about 50% of your DNA from your mom and about 50% from your dad. It's not exact, but it's approximate, okay? Now the next shell out is your grandparents right there. You see it? You get about 25% of your DNA from them. So what's going on there is that your parents are 50% your genetic ancestors, but 100% your genealogical ancestors. So you actually descend from them but you only get 50% of your DNA. And then the next generation out is 25. Then um, we can start doing math, right? <laughs> you know, 12 and a half percent, it goes down by half, uh, and so on and so forth, right? And then what are these dark green uh, ancestors out here? Well, what's going on with those dark green ancestors is those are ancestors that are really, you know, your genealogical ancestors, but they didn't give you any DNA. You got zero DNA from them, exactly zero DNA. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and just at 10 generations, it turns out about 60% of your ancestors at 10 generations, that's just about 300 years. They don't give you any DNA. It turns out, if you go back just a couple thousand years ago, you know, you're talking about like 99.9% .9 of your ancestors gave you no DNA. The ones that did give you DNA, it's not 100% gave you no DNA because you got DNA from somewhere, right? <laughs> That tiny percent that gave you DNA um, are kind of like the lottery winners that, that, they, that just kind of happened to get it from them. And that's important because it means that, that science tells us, you know, the science of genetics tells us a great deal about the past, particularly about populations. But, but very quickly, it becomes very hard to tell, uh, tell us anything about individual couples or people. And so... Adam and Eve, if they were real people, would just be in the, outside the streetlight of the genetics. It just wouldn't, science just wouldn't tell us much about them. They might even have been de novo created. Now, could they have been ancestors of everyone? It turns out that it's not only that they could, it's just that our best estimates indicate that if Adam and Eve were real people in a real past in the Middle East, most likely they would be ancestors of everyone. And by that, I don't mean that we get DNA from them. They'd most likely be genetic ghosts, but... They would be genealogical ancestors. What should we think about that? Well, you know, when people were writing the Bible, they didn't know about genetics. They didn't know about DNA. When it talks about Adam and Eve being our ancestors and, and historical theology, they're talking not about DNA. I mean, some people think that maybe Adam and Eve were a myth and it's not important they exist. I mean, I guess you could go that way. But at most, it's talking about genealogical ancestry. And so that's, that's the big surprise, that if you kind of switch over to thinking about this in terms of universal genealogical ancestry, genetics really just no longer becomes a pressure. What could be going on instead is this really beautiful symmetry that about two different stories being told about the same physical reality, that God creates this, this uh, population outside the garden by an evolutionary process, but then um, he tells, but he also creates a covenantal humanity through Adam and Eve. Now, Genesis is telling us the important story in theological history, in sacred history. It's telling us the story of Adam and Eve, who is ancestors of all of us, and how we all became fallen. Science is telling us another story that's also legitimate, but it's a different story. It's about the same physical reality. It's telling us the story of the people outside the garden. 
He's telling us about this, the story about the rise of civilization. And, you know, Nathan's talking about how excited he is about human evolution. I gotta tell you, once I got past the fear and the uncertainty about it, you know, the science here is really amazing. You, you don't wanna miss out on it. <laughs> it's just really cool to understand the real story about who we are and where we came from. And there's really big puzzles and mystery there still, and the story that we're finding is really grand. And I found out that these two stories could really fit together. Now, that was all written, my book came out in 2019. I didn't realize it could be as recent as just you know, 6,000 years ago, but I knew kind of about that before I kind of came to the point where I was okay with evolution. I mentioned I had also seen science, and, and you might be wondering, is, this, is the evidence really there? A really key thing for me was this article in 2005 where the first uh, chimpanzee genome was sequenced. I remember going through the figures, I'm just gonna show you one of them right now, and realizing that all these patterns just being reported, and this wasn't the paper that argued for evolution, it was just reporting data. All these weird features of the data, I knew immediately why. It looked that way it did, because I knew evolutionary theory at that point. I was in my PhD at the time, and I knew the basics of neutral theory and, and molecular clock. This is one of those examples of a figure. This is a really robust figure, I mean, uh, in the sense that you can measure um, similarity in many different ways, and you all, always get the same result. Um, you can see here that the distance here in this uh, tree um, is very short compared to the distance here. You see that? It's actually about 10 times bigger here than it is here, all right? What that's telling you is that humans and chimpanzees um, are much, much closer in sequences. There's about um, one-tenth the differences between human and chimpanzees than there is between mice and rats. You follow me? I remember looking at this and realizing exactly, knowing exactly why that is. Now, if you look at a mouse and a rat, you kind of think, well, okay, they're pretty similar. I mean, frankly, you know, naive me, I kind of think a, mice, a mouse and a rat are a lot more similar than a chimpanzee and a human, at least from some sort of, any sort of design or functional perspective. I mean, chimpanzees can't do anything quite like a human can. I mean, I mean, you say not so different, but I mean, give me a break. <laughs> But yet they were, they were so similar, and, and why is that? It turns out that there's a really simple mathematical formula that explains this, that, that basically the differences that we see are gonna be uh, the time that things separated in the fossil record times how quickly they're moving apart. So rate times time equals difference. And it turns out that humans and chimpanzees mutate a lot slower than, chimpanzee, I mean, than mice and rats, and they separated a lot more recently in time. And that explains why we're a lot less different than them genetically than mice and rats are. That doesn't explain the phenotypic changes, but it does explain this. Um, that's an example of where I started to see the evidence. I just wanted to go through that one example slowly, so hopefully you can see it too. Now, that wasn't enough for me either. <laughs> I think the big question that's really posed to me is, is whether or not Jesus is gonna be the foundation of my faith or, or if anti-evolutionism was gonna be. Now this is a, 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 it's called the mission statement <laughs> of a very prominent young earth creationist group. I don't think I ever saw this um, when I was growing up, but man, did I see the world that way. You can see here there's kind of castle Christianity and there's castle humanism. Wait a minute, you're a humanist, Nathan. <laughs> and it says that, that our foundations are evolution here and creation here and that there's kind of this war going on. Um, maybe these are some Christians kind of focused on the wrong things. Maybe, maybe these are the theistic evolutionists shooting their own foundation, right? And then you kind of have um, some people kind of fighting after all these things. And then uh, no one's really attacking the foundation, which is evolution. And that's their argument, that really this, the problem is that people aren't focused on attacking evolution. And I think I really bought this without even seeing it. I kind of knew that. And I remember actually as I was reading through the chimpanzee genome paper realizing, wait a minute, you know, God could have made it very clear in our genomes that we don't, didn't evolve from, from prominent ancestors of the great apes, but he didn't. Somehow maybe his priorities aren't the same as mine. <laughs> and as I started thinking about it, one of the key pieces of this is really understanding where I'm supposed to put my foundation. And scripture actually tells us the answer to that. It's not in creation. Our foundation isn't creation. Our foundation isn't opposing evolution. Our foundation is what? Do you guys remember? Who's the cornerstone? Yeah, it's Jesus, right? And there was one of these verses that, um, that really haunted me through many years as I was in 
you know, really caught up in a lot of these anti-evolution arguments, where Jesus says that um, to a skeptical generation, he's just going to give one sign, the sign of Jonah. The Son of Man is going to enter the, the belly of the earth and rise again three days later. There's just one sign. Like, they were wanting signs from him, but he only gave them one sign, and it was that. I think what I realized, and I think this is probably the most important thing, even if you disagree with this evolution stuff, um, whether you're a Christian or not, I mean, this is just true for me, and I think this is the key, the key thing that, that kind of unlocked it for me, is that whether or not evolution is true or false, let's just set aside whether it's true or false or not, God makes himself known to the world by raising this man, Jesus, from the dead. And it's really through that act in history that I know that God exists, that he's good, and he wants to be known. That's really the core piece of the gospel. You can see it in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7. And that's really where I came to place my epistemological foundation, or came to see that's why I follow Jesus. And so with that, I had freedom to look at evolution, and it all made sense at that point to me. So that's how I changed my mind, by seeing these three things for myself. If it was scripture, it could fit with scripture if it was true. I saw the scientific evidence myself, and I found a foundation in Jesus. So that's what I want to share with you. I hope it's helpful to you. Thank you for doing this in a very calm and civil way. I suppose we could be <laughs> shouting this out over Twitter or something, but you guys decided to do this uh, in person. And, and well, we're this. friends, though. So. You're <laughs> friends, exactly, exactly. So thank you for taking the high road and doing that. Um, I want to hear a little bit first about how you both met. Uh, you're sort of an unlikely duo in some ways, so tell us a little bit about how you met and how you know each other. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start. So I wrote a book that um, an, an organization called the Discovery Institute, which promotes intelligent design. Uh, they did not like my book very much, <laughs> or, or they don't like me very much. And um, so they came after me pretty hardcore and writing articles and things. Uh, actually, even before the book came out, they were responding to articles about the book, uh, in particular the, the Wall Street Journal article. And um, I was responding as fast as I could. They, they kind of overwhelm you with articles, and I was just by myself, you know, waking up to these Google alerts. Um, and then Josh reached out to me and uh, let me know that he is, was in the same boat, had been in the same boat, and why don't you take over from there? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm not really convinced by ID. I mean, I was at one time. And, I mean, what really made it a lot harder is I understood more biology to be convinced by the scientific arguments you're making. I'm very sympathetic to a lot of the theological concerns they have. But so I'm kind of frenemies with them. So at the same time, actually, that they were going after Nathan, at that moment, they were kind of going after me, too. So I was kind of going on and kind of noticing articles about me uh, that weren't always positive, but then I was seeing the, <laughs> the articles about Nathan. And so I thought I'd reach out. And uh, we kind of came, became friends kind of in that shared uh, misery of having a lot of public articles <laughs> going after us. Yeah, we were in competition to who could get more articles written about us <laughs> on Evolution News, uh, their website. And, uh, but, but he offered me his friendship, and he also helped me make sense of where they were coming from, what their approach is, why were they were doing this, because I'd never heard of them before this. And my book, I want to make, make it clear, it was not written to try to convince people about evolution, or, or even to attack and intelligent design. I thought people who didn't believe in evolution wouldn't notice my book. Or if they, if they preferred intelligent design over uh, natural selection, Dar Darwinian natural selection, again, they just wouldn't read my book. They'd laugh at it, scoff at it, and move on. You know, I, didn't, I wasn't writing to them. I would have written it very differently if I were writing it as an attack against intelligent design. Right? That would be a totally different book. I would choose different examples, different arguments. And so um, I was happy that they were spelling my name right. <laughs> um, because, you know, no, there's no such thing as bad press when it comes to selling books. <laughs> and um, I mean that. I, I, I was sort of plucked out of obscurity in a sense because even though, like, I, listen, my science is my science and I talk to other scientists, I publish, you know, do that work, you know, in the same, same world as you. Um, this public defense of evolutionary science wasn't anything I'd ever done before. I, I didn't, wasn't looking for it. It, 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 it. They just sort of, they came after me and partially through Josh's help, I began to fight back and say, well, you know what, I can get out there and, and, and uh, have this conversation as well. So without meaning to, they actually um, enlisted me in a war against them, <laughs> if, one, if you, you want to use the war analogy, because I've never been so active publicly since, since then. And you bring up intelligent design, I think we maybe benefit from just a brief definition as you understand it and how it fits into all of this. So intelligent design is a community of scientists, um, most of whom are very well-meaning. Um, I'm friends with many of them too. So the war analogies can be fun, but I don't even know if that really quite works. I mean, I think 
I, 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 you know, it started really when you know, I was in, in high school in the 90s, got really big in 2000, especially with the Dover trial. Uh, it's kind of faded a bit, but it's still important in a lot of church contexts where they're really offering a lot of scientific arguments against evolution and a lot, even though it's not a religious argument they're making, it, it's something a lot of Christians still really find a little bit of comfort in. I mean, I certainly did for a time. And so, um, so that, that, that's what ID is. They're offering specific scientific arguments. If you've heard of Michael Behe or Doug Axe, and there's a whole, there's a whole group of them. Um, they're, they're kind of putting together these arguments against evolution from a scientific point of view. Now, I don't think there's a problem with that. I mean, frankly, if, if any of them were right and actually had a solid argument, it would be very interesting. <laughs> I think in the end, um, on a scientific level, um, I would say you can even just throw out all the atheist biologists that you know. If you just focused on the Christian biologists, they haven't convinced anything more than a tiny handful of Christian biologists that there's any legitimacy to what they're saying. And um, I didn't know that at first, and it was just as I started to learn more about biology, I realized that they were just missing big things. And so that, that's, um, and so I think they're well-meaning, but I think they're just missing some key things. Right. It sounds like there's an attempt to try to reconcile, let's say, the truth of Scripture, um, if you're someone that affirms that belief, with the evidence that we see. And, uh, but are, you know, that makes me think, are there questions that only science can answer and um, science really can't answer other sorts of questions and are there questions that only scripture can answer um, and it's not really meaning. You know, this is something that I often hear. You read the opening chapters of Genesis, it doesn't speak to evolution, it doesn't speak to genetics. Um, and this is a question for both of you, I think, you know, or, um, you know, is, is it upon us to try to, to uh, weave a worldview that answers all of these questions uh, what can science answer? What can scripture answer? Well, I mean, I, I, think, I think most scientists know that science doesn't tell us everything. I mean, it's going to be like more the atheist apologists or the, I mean, that are trying to say something different. But, I mean, especially if you've ever done any scientific work, I mean, it's hard. And it's very narrow sorts of questions you can go after. And there's a lot of great questions, probably... The, probably the most interesting questions you usually can't actually get very much traction on scientifically because they're hard. And so the idea that there's important questions out there that are beyond science, it should be just, it should just be blatantly obvious, especially if you're a scientist. Would you agree with that? Um, yes. I, I, the only pushback I might give is I think that science can inform a lot of uh, issues that that aren't firmly in the realm of science, but that science has something to say about them. Well, sure, yeah. So, like, for example, end-of-life issues. That, that's, that's a moral question. That's a, an ethical question. It's a very personal question. It's a question that's on my mind a lot lately. Um, and I, but I do think that, this, that science and what we can measure about a person's brain, about a person's consciousness, about a person's awareness, about a person's um, entire experience, um, there... I don't know that you can get that any other way than scientific techniques. It doesn't tell you what to do, but it gives you information. And I think that's science at its best, is it just gives us information. And then we, as an evolved ape, <laughs> decide what to do with that information. And that's the fun part anyway, especially because once we get past all this fighting about evolution and creation and all this, we have such similar values. We want a lot of the same things. We, we want you know, a safe home, right? We want an earth that's gonna be sustainable. You know, we want to we want to be able to live without being uh, bothered and killed, and we want so many of the same things that when we stop fighting each other over things that really, in the end, don't matter to any of that, right? Because actually, my, my next door neighbor could not believe in evolution, and I could be talking about my work all the time, and he just keeps himself censored. And it doesn't matter. He's still my friend. He's still my neighbor. Like I don't care if he believes it or not, but I do care about what he thinks. Um, you know, about the, the school board election coming up. You know what I mean? Like, we have much bigger issues, I think. Um, and so, um, but I do think that science has a place at the table, and I think that people's values have a place at the table, you know, when it comes to politics and all those kinds of things. Um, so why, would, why do we disagree on things that we really just don't need to? We just, I just find it to be so unnecessary and so unhelpful. Yeah, to get to your question about Scripture, though, um, you were saying, because there are Christians that think that you know, you should just take Genesis as a mythological account, unless Genesis, early Genesis, Genesis 1 through 11. There, there are faithful Christians. I know some of them. I mean, I, I think that just a lot of Christians, um, 
have had a hard time with that view. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, I mean, it depends how you kind of draw the circles of what counts as Christian or not, but there, there's just large parts of the church that, that when they read Genesis, um, you know, before God, they have a very hard time seeing that as at least a faithful reading for themselves. And um, I, I, I think that matters. I mean, it just means that, you know, we don't want to present science in a way that creates a false sense of conflict. I mean, if there really is conflict, right. I, think, I think we need to be truthful about that. But if there isn't, I think we need to be very truthful about that too. And we need to have the same sort of honesty and rigor in how we engage these theological questions about Adam and Eve that we do in the science papers that you submit in, in your groups. And I think that's one place where um, that, you know, the scientific community could do better instead of you know, mocking those sorts of theological questions. I think there's an opportunity for, ta for taking it seriously. And I think what we'll find and what we are finding one of the things that Nathan's done, I gotta give him credit for, he's come to several of these theological conferences with me. <laughs> um, he's done a couple at WashU, kind of workshopping my book. He's done some stuff with uh, Reasons to Believe and with Bill Craig. It's been kind of fun. He ends up being often either the only or one of the few atheists in the room. <laughs> um, oh, wait a minute, that's kind of an offensive term. Secular humanists in the room. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, and, and I think what we find out is that we're often really caught up in the same grand question of what it means to be human. And, and there's, a, there's a value, I think, even to a scientist that doesn't believe that Genesis is true in that same sense that I do, to connect like this inquiry, inquiries we have into how humans arise into this longer, older discourse about the image of God uh, the human state and nature, and I think there's, there's these common threads. That, that, that's why these things are so compelling. That's part of the reason why Genesis matters so much. It's because um, you know, where we come from does tell us something about who we are. It doesn't tell us everything, um, and, but it does tell us something. You know, I, uh, it, you know, I, that, I think even kind of wondering about that is part of the distinct things of the human experience, right? <laughs> to wonder where we came from. What would you say? I think that's a well, fundamental question where we intersect is what does it mean to be human? Why am I here? Who am I really? Yeah. But how would you answer that question? Well, I mean, the fact that we're doing this right now, having these conversations and asking these questions, we're already doing something that no other species does <laughs> and no other species has. So um, we're chimpanzees so are not so there recently. So Listen, <laughs> a paper just came out this week that uh, chimpanzees use insects to create medicine to, cure, to care for each other's wounds. So I don't like when people denigrate the abilities of chimpanzees, but I don't think they do calculus and I don't think they read Genesis. <laughs> um, they don't uh, do Veritas. But they're, very, but they're much smarter <laughs> about their world that they live in, you know, we, we measure intelligence in such very specific ways, right? These are really very, very specific cognitive skills that go into what we call intelligence. But Neanderthals, while they probably, you know, couldn't do what we're doing, were probably way smarter at us at surviving an ice age, you know, and just natural intuitive intelligence about that. So um, to go back to the, 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 the question that you asked, um, I think that I find that I have more in common with someone who's asking these questions than someone who has the same answers that I have. You, you see what I'm saying? Like, there might be people who, I, who probably would check the same boxes that I would on what you believe, but I can't sit down and talk about any of this stuff with them. It's just not, they're just not interested. But somebody who is, even though they believe something different, like Josh, I can talk for hours. So I find my fellowship and camaraderie with people who are just interested in asking these questions and who are fascinated by the past in particular, because obviously that's my interest. Um, and wow, that's a lot of common ground. Just, just caring where we came from and why we are the way we are. Um, just caring about it is enough for me. We can come to different answers, but. In my conversations with students over the years, um, there's a couple of hangups about evolution. Uh, I think one of them is reconciling the evidence. Sometimes, uh, let's say that they have a, a view of, of scripture inerrancy or at least believe in a creator God. So trying to work out the details so that we're faithful to the evidence that we see and we're faithful to scripture, that's one thing. But I sense that there's also this um, hang up that um, we're put on the same playing field as animals and that that somehow degrades or diminishes our uniqueness. The next thing they're going to say is we're on the same level as dust. 
Right, right. Well, but wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, <that's>, huh. Exactly. <laughs> I've heard that before somewhere, right? <laughs> We're made from dust. No, but you hear what I'm saying. I do think that there is some pang of disappointment. At least I sense that. And that, that might be part of the stumbling block. And it's not just all about, you know, making sure the dates and the times and the materials add up. Um, does it diminish our significance in any way that we evolve from a common ancestor? Well, I mean, I think, I think it's a very understandable feeling, but what should be far more challenging than evolution is what scripture teaches. I mean, scripture it literally says, like, what is man that you're mindful of us? It has, like, a, a picture of such a grand God that the real question is, why should he care about us? It's not that we're so amazing that, of course, God loves us. I think if we really take that on board, we should be much more concerned about that. And, like, you know, I don't know if you actually know much about the great apes, but they're pretty amazing creatures. That's actually, you know, if you're going to be descended from any animals out there, being descended from the, you know, common ancestors of the great apes isn't so bad. What scripture teaches... And it's not a coincidence, Josh. <laughs> and what, we find them recognizable. <laughs> well, yeah, but I just try to say that, like, you compare that to what scripture teaches, it's like dirt. <laughs> that's, um, that, that's pretty lowly, um, what, where God says that he kind of creates us out of it. I think what, the actual teaching of scripture is not that humans are so amazing that God had to fall in love with us. It's rather that we are part of creation. We're creatures. That's a term that God, I mean, that's in theology, is that we're creatures. And the big puzzle isn't how amazing we are, but rather how it is in the world that the God of all creation chose to actually care about these creatures. There's like a theologian in the room who's looking at me going, I think that's about right. <laughs> Maybe I said some heresy, I don't know. <laughs> He's saying, no, I didn't, good. <laughs> so I think uh, one of the big takeaways that I have from this conversation is the difference between, I'm really fascinated by this, the difference between genealogical ancestry and genetic ancestry and the fact that I don't have to go back very many generations, apparently, before I do not share genetic information with my ancestors. Um, it's a bit of a head scratcher for me, but you know, I think if you would have asked someone 200 years ago, um, who are your ancestors? It would have been answered genealogically. These are my parents, these are my grandparents. That's what they understood about things. And it seems like, you know, fast forward to 2022, in the age of 23andMe, different variants of the coronavirus, we have this understanding of what genetic material is, what DNA is, that's a pretty modern concept. But I think this, this, these ghost ancestors make me realize that even the genetic material is a little bit transient. It sort of comes and it goes, and uh, it's not penetrating for multiple generations on end. So a question for the evolutionist. I, I know you wrote, does that, does that, is that incorporated into modern evolutionary theory? Does it challenge the ability, you know, when I was a student, we had to put together these big trees of life where you use sequence homology like you have to construct these ancestries. That, to me, sort of throws a wrinkle in things because... If DNA is that transient, I know this is a bit of a technical question, what does that do for evolutionary theory? Well, so there's a, yeah, this is yeah. a great question. Yeah, this is a great <clears throat> question. So first of all, I think it does challenge it in the sense of anyone who tries to teach you that that's the whole story is just flat out wrong. Even in other animals, but definitely for humans. Yeah, I mean, it is not, the, whatever we get out of science is not the whole story. Whatever we get out of genetics in particular, it's just not the whole story. So even if it's telling a true story that's correct, that we've completely understood, it is, just a tiny fraction of the story. And at best, it's kind of like a cartoonized view of populations, very cartoonized. Now, um, what does that mean for evolution? Well, it turns out the reason why it works that way is the vast majority of genetic changes are neutral. They don't actually have a selective effect. And this is actually how new, uh, evolution works. This is like the big discovery that Kimura made <laughs> in the 60s. Um, and that has been really developed since then because there's an exception to the rule. In biology, there's always exception. When I said that, you know, it's gonna always fall out. The one exception is if there's a mutation that actually gives a big advantage. And so while you're, you we're doing all these trials, most of which are being lost, if any of those changes, and there's a lot more, um, in every generation, just about every, uh, in every single generation for a population of like eight billion or so that we have now, just about every single um, single point mutation is attempted across that one generation. For the ones that actually have a benefit, those will pretty rapidly spread across the entire population. That's, that's the thing that's different. So those ones will be much more likely to get. Those are rare. They don't happen very often, but if they are positive and they're beneficial, they're gonna spread everywhere. 
And it doesn't take that long. And it doesn't take that um, long. It just takes a couple thousand years. So does that say more, though, about... I know you have something to say. Does that say more about what I would call... I'm not a, a, an evolutionary uh, theorist, but about convergent evolution, that maybe the Earth and its environment is just shaped a certain way, and we can't really say as much about how closely linked two species are. It just says that they live in a similar environment, their genomes are adapting in a certain way and going in a certain direction. That so that would be true if you were only looking at the regions of the genome that are expressing a functional protein, for example. You gotta remember, the vast majority of our genome doesn't code for anything. Um, and those are the regions that we actually tend to use when it comes to genetic evolution. And that's the part of the, my presentation I didn't get to. But we have things called pseudogenes, for example. These are genes that uh, are no longer functional, but they were in the ancestral past. So they, they look like a gene, they have the parts of a gene. It's like looking at a car in the junkyard. You can see it's a car, it has most of the parts, but it can't function as a car even a little bit, right? It's a completely, uh, but some of the parts could be taken out and retooled. That's a good analogy for a pseudogene because it doesn't function at all, but it looks like it almost can. Well, we don't just have one or two of these. We have 15,000 pseudogenes, which is almost as many protein coding genes, about 22,000 uh, functioning protein coding genes. So we have, so if you look at those, those are totally unaffected by the environment that you live in, totally unaffected by uh, you know, migration, gene flow, and all of this. They're just there mutating at the background gradual rate. So they're very useful for measuring things like how, how recently you diverged from this line, that kind of thing, because they're not subjected yeah. to the normal forces. And then you also have like endogenous retroviruses we didn't talk about. So, so these are carcasses, basically, of former viral infections. And they're inserted throughout our genome and from when that, that infection took place, and we can date them because of that mutation rate. And we have ones that are unique to us, ones that are unique, or that are shared with chimpanzees, ones that are that further back with gorillas and chimpanzees, and so on and so forth. Those have no function uh, anymore, and they do not interact with the environment at all, so they're like a ticking clock that we can use to measure rates. And that's why I said you don't need fossils to actually date the age of a gene. I can tell you roughly how old each of our genes are in the genome by using these, these, these tricks. Um, so, so that's why it can't just be convergent evolution. That, that would only work if the entire genome was functional, and most of it isn't. Um, that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to point out, since you mentioned 23andMe, and we're talking about genealogical ancestry and genetic ancestry, there's a great parallel to this. There's biological evolution and there's cultural evolution. And that's really the major force in human history. Uh, not just recorded human history, but going back at least 200,000 years, what has dominated our destiny is cultural events and, and the way that we interact with our environment and pass information from generation to generation is far more important than our genes. Um, just like your genealogy is far more important than your genetics. Right. So you're not Irish because you have Irish DNA, right. right? You are Irish because an ancestor lived there, cooked potatoes, um, flew a flag and do all this, which are very arbitrary things to do, right? But we attach ourselves to them because it has a sense of identity, it gives our family a sense of cohesion, it has recognition and solidarity with others. Those are the things that matter in a cultural environment. Genetically, it's nonsense but that doesn't make it unimportant. Right. So the genetics tells some stories, and the rest of it, and in fact, the more meaningful, this is a geneticist, and I'm telling you, genetics is not that important. <laughs> you also adopted two kids. <laughs> yeah, that's right. My, I, I have a fitness score, in evolutionary biology terms, that is negative. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so not only do I not have biological children of my own, I'm investing my resources in somebody else's biological children, and I'm happy to do it. So that's what I mean, genetics isn't everything. All right, I think we're going to make a transition. This conversation could probably go very technical very quickly, and we could be here for another hour. I think it's best to turn to, uh, to some questions from our audience. So, uh, question for Josh. If there were people outside the garden, how do we think about the image of God and original sin? Were those other creatures human? Uh, were they made in the image of God? How should we think about that? Yeah, this is one of the cool things about how it's been playing out in my book. Um, my book, if you read it, you'll find out that it's an invitation for other scholars to kind of engage these exact questions. And what's been exciting the last two years is that a lot of scholars have really taken me up on that. There's actually even, and there's some graduate students here, I wonder, there's actually graduate students that have been getting in contact with me that are doing their dissertations in theology on my book, which I think is just so cool. <laughs> and they're asking these sorts of questions. Um, now, I'll give you my take on it, but, and try and give you a sense of how some people think about it. I think. Um, 
I think that the people outside the garden probably were in the image of God, but theologians can't even agree about what the image of God is. <laughs> but when I see scripture, I don't see anything that limits the image of God to just Adam and Eve's lineage. Um, were they, um, you know, where did the sin begin and all that? Well, I, I, I think that there was probably something very important and different about Adam and Eve's sin. I think Adam was probably the first person who directly transgressed God's law. That's how Romans talks about it, especially Romans 5. This is the first transgressor. So maybe there are people who had done wrong, but they weren't actually directly violating God's command. And, and then that had consequences that ended up having an impact on everyone. Now, there's other ways to think about it too. Um, you know, so Bill Craig, um, who's become a friend of mine through this, he, he, he uh, just wrote a book too that's kind of made some, made some waves. He doesn't like the idea of having fully human people outside the garden. <laughs> and so he, he, so he kind of looks in, in history about where humanness arises and uh, once again, in, in some really great conversations with uh, Nathan. Nathan actually wrote a really excellent article in, uh, in The Skeptic, which is worth reading, that came out earlier, uh, earlier last month. He thinks that humanness arose about you know, 700,000 years ago in the past. So he thinks Adam and Eve are back then, and that we all descend from them. Now, I, I don't understand that entirely, but, and why he's doing it. I mean, I understand why he's doing it. I don't know why he would choose to do that. Does that make sense? <laughs> but that's his view, and it's kind of maybe more like the standard Catholic view. I think there's other people who are taking other positions on this and thinking about it. And I think there is this bigger question arising about like how do we think about what is a human from a, from a scriptural point of view with the freedom to know that it doesn't have to correspond with something like homo sapiens or any sort of like taxonomical category. Like science doesn't give us the story about what human is anyways. It doesn't have, we don't, you know, scientists don't have a good definition for human. And when we start talking about human from these theological questions, we really have to think about, well, how does scripture define human? And what, what, is, what are the theologians saying about what this human is? And that's where the conversation, I'd say, is getting really, really interesting. Yeah. Is, is there nothing science could say about what makes us distinctly human? Have you come across something that's like clearly, uniquely human? Yeah, I mean, we can definitely describe you know, human uniqueness. Uh, genetically, that's what my lab does, is, is we look at the d genetics of human um, uniqueness. But there are ability, cognitive abilities, morphologies, uh, anatomy. <laughs> um, there's all kinds of things that we have that other creatures don't, because every creature has things that's unique to that creature. Um, absolutely. Um, but, you know, the, the, the idea that humans are really, truly special, um, scientifically, comes from culture. That, that's it, because we, we, our ability uh, through language to have a repository of knowledge that's distributed amongst the individuals and then, and then transmitted generation to generation so that it's the cumulative uh, construction of knowledge. Each generation builds on, the, that's new. So all animals learn, but only humans teach. That's one way, you know, intentionally teach. That's one way to see it. Uh, and that really puts us in a whole different category. So cultural evolution is often thought of as evolution in warp drive or warp speed, because you can accomplish in a generation what would take you know, thousands of generations to wait around for a mutation. What, right? what would you say cultural evolution? Help flesh that out a little bit more. Cultural evolution is the idea that you, you inherit certain skills and abilities um, that you then retain and pass on and you would add to your toolkit. So for example, uh, um, and, and a culture, like, for example, think about agriculture, right? So Yeah, yeah. So let, let's talk, start even simpler than that. A beaver just makes a dam. He knows how to do it. Nobody has to teach him. It's actually embedded. The knowledge is embedded in his, in his DNA. He doesn't have to learn how to do that. A beaver just makes a dam, right? But what a human does has, so that's why we have to go to school <laughs> to learn how to make a dam. You could make a dam if you wanted to, right? <laughs> but you'd have to be taught. And so cultural evolution is not waiting around for the mutations to come around and give you an ability because, wow, you'll wait 10,000 years for one thing. So what we do is we, we, through language, have a repository of knowledge that exists independent of the individuals, right? It exists distributed amongst the individuals in a population. And that's, by the way, we've seen when populations shrink to very small size, they lose all their technology in a generation. Not all, but most of their technology is just gone because it, you know, it was distributed amongst the population. That's unique. There's no, there's no creature that does that, that has this distributed knowledge set that then they build on over and over. Of course, then we started writing and then it became you know, even independent of the population. But Is, is that ability itself genetically encoded? You said the beaver can make a dam, you know, we know the canary can sing. 
Yeah. Do humans have just the, is it a genetic, it's, it's language. genetically encoded capacity to learn and pass? Yeah, it's, it's language and it's memory, right? Yeah. So we have big, big brains, big memories, but so do other animals. Some, there are animals with incredible memories. And you, you mentioned singing birds. There are songbirds that know hundreds, I don't know if it's hundreds, but 140 is the largest number I've seen of a songbird. That's how many songs they can sing correctly, repeatedly. Like two weeks, they'll sing it again, exactly the same, I mean, within reason. So they have good memories, but what they don't have is language, right? I mean, they can communicate, but they don't have language like yeah, but, we have. But, but you, we were talking about like what makes a person human, though. I mean, like what is human? That's still there's still this mapping then of like what point do we become human in the past? Like that, there's no there's like no process that we can use scientifically to say whether or not, for example, Neanderthals are human. It really comes down to a lot of presuppositions we bring, uh, and really, frankly, definitions we bring. Yeah, we've decided to, to call it's almost by convention humans. that we'll call things human or not yeah, right. as we as we start looking at it. And another example is like let's just step out of like our world for now and go to Star Trek. Right? Are Klingons human? <laughs> right? Are Klingons human? By the definition you just gave, they absolutely are humans, <laughs> but they're not Homo sapiens, right? So that sort of like uh, complicating realities we're not even really having to work through in science just because we're in a world that doesn't have those sorts of complicators yet. But, but you would say well, a text like the Bible would speak to that specifically. It would make the confession and say, this is what it means to be human. It's made in the image of God. So it doesn't actually say that, I mean, so the, if you read through Genesis, one of the big surprises I had when I started talking to actual experts at seminaries was finding out that the word human doesn't actually appear in Genesis. Ever. And like when you read, for example, in Genesis 126, where it says, God made mankind in the image of God, and he made male and female in the image of God, or whatever, that word is just a dom. Right. And it's being used um, to, to mean both male and female, too, which is strange. And the next passage, it talks about, you know, Adam being created, and in that case, it is a male. So that, that's confusing. That doesn't make sense. It turns out that the word for human being used in Genesis is the same word as the proper name of Adam, of Adam. Yeah. Um, and so that, that, that's interesting, right? So, so what's going on with that? Um, I remember, uh, and you know, it gets translated into Greek, and so there is a Greek word for human, it's called anthropos, that's being used, but it's, it's used in a, the translations are, are really interesting, what's translated to anthropos and what isn't, that's maybe not what we'd expect. So what I, what I argue is that actually the way how scripture's really talking about human is it's really defining, and this is actually a very old idea that I'm, that I'm kind of uh, recovering, is that the way how scripture defines human, uh, at least one definition, isn't really the image of God, but rather it's just Adam and Eve and their descendants. Yeah. And if that's true, then um, you know, it's telling us a story of Adam and Eve and, our, and their descendants. It's not really talking about homo sapiens. And like I said, I don't see any grounding in scripture to really insist that the people outside the garden were less human um, from you know, the scientific point of view or the way how we kind of use it in other parlance, right? right? Or to say that they weren't in the image of God. So maybe they're fully in the image of God. They're fully, you know, fully human persons, but, but they're just not what scripture is really focused on. They're telling us a story rather of Adam and Eve and their descendants, which by the way, would include everyone here, right? Right, right. So uh, on that note, um, as we're trying to affirm, um, you know, what scripture teaches, I have, uh, imagine you get this question a lot, I got it tonight, um, how does the flood affect our understanding of human ancestry? How does that, how's that worked in to um, a rigorous scientific explanation of how we got here? Can we lose most of humanity and still have the model that you present? Well, you have to look at what actually the text says. So once again, if you, if you go off a naive and rigid literal reading of an English translation, you're gonna have a lot of problems. Okay. But who's doing that? I mean, like, we should all know that that's not the right way to do this. I think if you actually look at what the Hebrew says, even if you wanna take it literally, it's it, it, the word for all of humanity being destroyed is all of Adam's being destroyed. Mm -hmm. It's that word Adam. It's talking about the descendants of Adam and Eve. And what's the place, that, what's the world that it's talking about? It's talking about their world and it's talking about their rats. I mean, if you read what the Rets means, it doesn't mean the planet Earth. They didn't know the Earth was a planet at that time. They talk about lands beyond the Rets. It's talking about that area. So if you're gonna read Genesis literally, it's just talking about that area being destroyed by the flood. And it turns out that there's really, you know, there's really interesting 
evidence, actually, in scientific. I mean, it's purely secular stuff that shows that there was, um, for example, in the Persian Gulf oasis. You know, you guys know where the Persian Gulf is. It's right by Iraq and Saudi Arabia. It's a gigantic area. It used to be a, um, it used to be a, a gigantic oasis that wasn't underneath the ocean because the, 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 um, the oceans were 400 feet lower. <laughs> Is this gigantic oasis that had water coming up out of the ground because it was below the aquifer level. And, um, and that's also in the range which it's consistent with oral history being able to retain that. There's been these really interesting studies they look at Aborigines and look at their, their stories that they have. And they, have, they retain a memory going back about 10,000 years to when the, floods, when the waters were lower. They can know the, the geography underneath the water from their, from their stories. Isn't that crazy? Anyways. Um, it just it just seems to be a one thing to, that that a lot of uh, a lot of theologians honestly have found really interesting in a place of connection where maybe the, what's being talked about in Genesis, even if you're going to say it's a pure myth, that there's some sort of connection to that physical world that's being talked about. They knew about the locations that were being talked about um, when it describes where uh, where the Garden of Eden is right. in, in Genesis two. We kind of lost that history, but I think they knew it. Even if you're going to say it's a myth. Um, and it's not real anatomy of our real, the way it's talked about in Genesis kind of presumes that the readers know where that is. So I think if you actually read it in Hebrew <laughs> and talk to people who understand it in Hebrew, and, and it, like I said, it's not about whether I take it literal or, or mythological. You can read it very literally. Just don't read it in English literally. Read it in Hebrew literally. Then a lot of this stuff really just doesn't become a problem. Yeah. We have time for one more question to kind of wrap this up. And uh, I'm gonna, it's a personal question. I really appreciate you all's humility, uh, the ability to talk to one another. Um, I like how you defer to the text, you defer to the data, um, you defer to a theologian who's in a different field. Um, I just think we can learn a lot from that. And it seems to me like in both of your quests to figure stuff out, you've had to change your views on things. I've heard you said in another talk that you set out to know what was distinctly human and found, oh, they we're not so different in some ways. I know that there were a lot of surprises, so maybe just leaving everyone tonight um, in turn, talking about how that has been a helpful approach, um, what it takes to do that, and how it's really uh, benefited you, I think, to approach these matters with humility. Just the fact that you're sitting here together tonight as friends is a wonderful example. So maybe just uh, answer that, that prompt uh, before we go. Uh, I will say it's very hard to keep an open mind, and, and just in general about things. We get so committed to our ideas uh, and our own thoughts about things. One thing I found that helps me is to not vocalize <laughs> your first reaction to anything, because then you have a tendency to, to, to dig your heels in and say, I, I feel this way, I think this way. And so it is perfectly okay, even in our digital world of Twitter, it is perfectly okay to say, you know what, I don't know enough about this to have an opinion. That is a wonderful thing to say. That shows, uh, that shows wisdom, that shows um, humility, as you say, to say, you know what, I, I don't know about this, enough about this to have an opinion yet. And so um, that's hard to do, and it's, it's hard, especially when you have your closely you know, held beliefs, um, but to keep an open mind. But to also know that um, most of these questions, um, I don't think you know, life and limb or the, the destiny of your soul and a lot of these things really do hang on getting exactly all of these details right anyway. I think the fun is in the exploration and with an open mind and an open heart and also with the um, goal of not of beating a, an opponent um, but rather of learning something. And you do not learn anything from someone who thinks the same way as you. you, you what can they teach you? So you learn the most when you surround yourself with people who are different than you, who think differently than you, that look differently than you. That's who has the most to teach you. Everyone you've ever met knows something you don't, but the more different they are, the more they have to teach you. So that's my, that's my greatest lesson. Did you want to respond? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that it, it is hard, but it's also really fun. I mean, <laughs> isn't it? Very much. I, I'd also say too, I mean, you just look around, we live in a really fractured society where things that really should not be controversial and politicized really are. I mean, uh, if you're paying attention even a little bit, part of you has to be concerned about that, right? This is a really broken sort of thing. This is not the best possible world. I, I, <laughs> right? Suboptimal. It's suboptimal. <laughs> it's poorly designed. <laughs> I just think that, you know, um, 
I mean, most, most people here are a lot younger than, than us now. We're kind of in the older generation now, man. <laughs> this is crazy. Who are you talking scary. to? We're the same age. <laughs> Look, I, I think that, I, I just really hope that, um, that, that your generation does better on these things. Um, that, uh, that, you, that you pick your heroes well and that you try and emulate them and that you really try and find a way to work with people you really disagree with on really important things but to really serve the common good with them. I mean, if you guys can't do that, it's just gonna get worse. I mean, we're doing what we can and we still make mistakes, but I would really hope that, you know, in the generation that comes after us, that what we're doing would be less anomalous.